it caused a sensation in America, um, and it's still quite a cult subject. Uh, you can read about quite a cult subject. Uh, you can read about it in things like Shavertron magazine, which is now a website online, and there are various reprints of these stories that are written by, by um, Richard Shaver, um, allegedly true, but written like science fiction stories. Um, and these are a big cult following still, even today in America. Perhaps less so now than it was in the 70s, but um, it's still a cult following in America. Um, less well known here, uh, as, part of, as I said, with part of perhaps a few Fortean Times readers, but a fascinating story. And I think particularly fascinating because not only does it sort of, like, sort of uh, break down the boundary between science fiction and sort of like real mysteries that are supposedly true, um, it also is a kind of a bridge that crosses from very early um, science fiction and horror stories like H.P. Lovecraft and that circle with later on ufological stories and it's sort of the main bridge and, it, and a lot of this, the, the stuff we know that we believe now about UFOs actually comes from the Shaven mystery which a lot of people don't realise that. It's like an urtext for, for a lot of ufological mysteries. Also science fiction stories have taken a lot from it as well. Um, so it's a real cultural urtext for the 20th century which is strange that it's not so widely known, possibly because the story is very, very strange in itself, that a lot of people would have difficulty taking it seriously. Um, so it's the urtext that, that, that is at the root of a lot of UFO stuff, some modern science fiction, but bridges a lot of the um, H.P. Lovecraft types, sort of like horrors, and, and Charles Fultz writing himself was, was, was a big influence on on, on, on failure, it seems. So it's a really important cultural bridge. Um, and there's a lot to get to, so I'm gonna, it's basically going to read um, what is a reworking of an article I wrote a couple of years ago about this. The article was quite sort of in two parts, but I've cut it down to a basic talk, giving a, a basic outline of what the Shaver mystery was, and also um, a kind of a few different perspectives, and including a few new perspectives as well that you know, I've been thinking about in the last few days. So, um, so we go. Return of the Dero. Um, so we start in 1943 um, with a guy called Ray Palmer, who is the editor for the past five years of a quarterly science fiction magazine called Amazing Stories. Now, in 1943, Palmer was contacted by his publishers. Ziff Davis Publishing and informed that an extra supply of paper was available for an increased print run of the magazine. So this is a bit strange in sort of the middle of World War II um, to have that extra paper, but it's possible that uh, certain other magazines had closed and they had this extra paper that they were, that were, that they were sort of redirecting towards other magazines. Why they wanted to put it towards Amazing Stories, I, I, I don't know, but that was, that was what they chose. They got in touch with Palmer and they just said, we've got this paper, you can do some extra print runs. Um, Palmer was really keen on that and he wanted to, at the time, he wanted to boost the circulation of the magazine and so he was on the lookout for really sensational material that he, would, that, that would, he could publish and would really boost um, the, the sales of Amazing Stories, which at the time was a very serious uh, science fiction magazine that was published in sort of like a mix of pulp science fiction and more serious science fiction stories um, but didn't have that great uh, 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 circulation and Palmer was ambitious to really boost up this, this circulation of the magazine with something a bit more sensational and he found this sensational material in an obscure letter that was sent to him by a guy called Richard Sharp Shaver. Now, now Shaver had sent Palmer a letter in which was an account of a, what he called a primeval phonetic language called Mantong, and which on the face of it sounds absolutely crazy and absurd, um, but Palmer really liked the idea. And what Mantong was, according to, to, to uh, Shaver, was the language of ancient Lemuria and Atlantis that had been originally brought to Earth from outer space and was um, the source of all human languages. All human languages came from Mantong, apparently. Um, and this was not, not just some kind of like cheesy science fiction pulp story. Shaver was absolutely convinced that this was a fact. Um, Mantong was an absurd language, even 
in, in, in the little bit I said about it in the letter. Um, very, very similar to English, which should have been a warning straight away, um, and very, very unlike Chinese, despite being the origin of all human languages, according to Shaver. Um, but not only that, as he, as he later revealed, not only was Mantong um, the, the source of all languages on Earth, Mantong was also the source of all languages in this quarter of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so, um, it was odd that, um, that, that, that Palmer would take this seriously, although it was very entertaining. Um, and, and, and it's probably the fact that Shaver at this point didn't really take it that seriously. He thought it was just something that really amuses his readership and, um, uh, and, and I sell a few more copies. The odd things about it, the things that really give the game away about Manton, was it's based on 26 letters of the alphabet, which are identical to the English letters of the alphabet, which is kind of strange. But of course, according to Shaver, that was just that it's closer to the extraterrestrial language, and English is like the pure extraterrestrial language. So he has got his own kind of crazy sort of like reasoning to it. Um, but the way Manton worked was that it was a phonetic. So you would break down um, the letters of a word, particularly in English, which is all he really dealt with, um, mainly, uh, into um, the, the phonetic or the letters and, and, and work out what the word actually meant you know, in an almost like a poetic kind of way. Um, sometimes it was letters that he broke it down into, sometimes it was, it, it was, it, it was the sort of phenomes, um, sometimes it was just some kind of like pidgin language sort of playing with the meaning of different parts of the word. So there were no hard and fast rules, but he did have a kind of sort of a rough abstract system and so you've got things like the letter A, which he, which he said was based on an, which was, which was the root meant animal or life form, or B, which meant B, to exist, or meant beings. Um, C meant con, to have consciousness of, or, or, or to see, and literally see and perceive. Um, D, which was very important, um, or as he pronounced it, day, um, and it meant harmful negative energy, which he believed came from the sun, and was the root of destructive, degenerative, and depression. All these sort of negative things was, was root of this sort of harmful negative energy. Uh, he actually pronounced D, I mean, most people now seem to pronounce D, Dero as Dero, but he actually pronounced Dero as Dero, um, which is kind of, um, so I presume he, he pronounced it D Day as well. So I don't know, I've never heard him speak that, but uh, although there are, are, are radio interviews with him that I, I haven't been able to listen to yet, so I'd be interested to see how he, how he pronounces all these words. Um, you've got other things like G for generate and O for orifice, pretty obvious. Um, T, in, in, in contrast, is the positive energy. So in addition to this negative energy called D, day, um, you've got the positive energy called T. And he has a, quite an interesting kind of like Taoist kind of thing going on as well. Because he says X symbolises the balance or the conflict between D energy and T energy, between positive and negative energy. And Z, or Z, which meant zero, was when these, are balanced, these negative and positive energies are balanced out into the void. So it's a kind of interesting, sort of semi-kind of philosophical concept behind this, about these positive and negative energies. But a lot of, a lot of kind of craziness as well. Um, for instance, the way he, the way he would um, interpret words was, for instance, cat, which he said cat was a life form which perceives positive energy. The C for perceives and the T for positive energy. So a cat perceives positive energy. But dog, which had the D for negative energy, was a thing that produces negative energy. Uh, but there was a problem with this because, so therefore, God also produces negative energy. So he, but he'd really, he, he latched onto this, I actually respelled God as God, so it had the positive T on the end, so it wouldn't fall into that trap. Or, you know. So he kind of plays around a bit, you know, he's, he's, you know, English is okay apart from that when German is a little bit better. Um, <laughs> so there's all these different things. Um, and he, he, I, I shall talk about this more in a little bit, but he actually comes up with this, this, this race of beings called the Dero, or Dero, which are supposed to, which I'll explain a bit more, but um, they're, they're, they're supposed to be like the, the, the harbingers and the, and the manipulators of all this negative energy. Um, and the, the word Dero comes from, he said, comes from degenerate robots or um, um, this, the, these, these robotic beings that channel this day negative energy. Um, and it's, and it's a kind of strange idea. But interestingly, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, we were having a conversation, 
Um, I recently found that he also had another word in Mantong, um, which he said was the, was the palace or the base of the, of the Dero, and that was the Trocadero, and, which is quite funny, because I think that might be where he actually got the word Dero from, because at the time, there's a famous Trocadero in, 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 in Paris, which is sort of was, became a sort of a bohemian art centre, but in San Francisco, just before the time he was writing, there was a Trocadero sort of bar in San Francisco, which was one of the most decadent places in, in America at the time. And the Dero was supposed to be these decadent beings. So it's possible that he had made this connection with Trocadero. And Dero really comes from this word, Trocadero. So it's kind of, that might be the origin, the real origin of where he gets his name from, which I think is quite, quite amusing. Um, so, surprisingly, you know, this seems absurd, this sort of Manton language, but Shaver, despite um, all the warnings from his staff, um, saying, no, don't publish this, it's crazy, um, uh, um, Palmer publishes this in the January 1944 issue of Amazing Stories. Um, but what happens, this really takes off, people are actually fascinated by Manton, the sales shoot up, People are like, want to know, they're writing letters, they'll tell us more about this Manton, how does he know about it? What, who are these Daira? Where do they come from? Um, so he really catches them to it, says, wow, this is it, this is what's gonna, really going to put up the sales of amazing stories. So um, he, writes, he writes to um, Shaver and he says, tell me more, send me more about this, tell me what your sources are, how you know about this. And he gets a huge amount of correspondence from Shaver about ancient aliens, subterranean mutants and visitors from outer space who would, when, when transformed into um, fictional form, would transform the circulation of amazing stories overnight. Um, but before we go into that a bit more, it's, it's interesting to talk a bit about, about Ray Palmer and who Ray Palmer actually was, because he's quite an interesting character in himself. Uh, Ray Palmer was more than just a science fiction editor. Uh, an eccentric character of dwarfish appearance due to a, a gross stunting childhood accident. He was an, also an early Fortean and something of a mystic who had successfully turned his, 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 um, his hand to writing sensational pulp science fiction, sometimes with a hidden message, but always with an eye to sales and, and marketing. Later, he will be at the centre of the public perception of the emerging UFO phenomena at uh, first employing Kenneth Arnold himself as an investigative reporter into the mystery, soon after his famous uh, Flying Saucer sightings, um, and also was the person to first publish um, some of the full reports of Kenneth Arnold's sightings, um, as well as being closely associated with the pulp writer and notorious UFO investigator and hoaxer, Gray Barker, um, who also became one of Palmer's chief writers. Um, Barker himself was, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a very um, ambiguous character. On one hand, apparently a serious UFO investigator. On the other hand, notorious hoaxer who made up hundreds of stories and, and possibly invented the whole man in black myth. Um, so you've got a little circle of writers who, are, who are, have a sense of humour, or semi-believe in this stuff, but also um, are interested in selling stories as well and perhaps in producing hoaxes as well. So this all has to be taken in, in, into consideration. Um, later on, Palmer will publish magazines like Flying Saucer magazine, which will give a big impetus to the whole Flying Saucer mystery um, in the 1950s. But his key involvement in ufology was also interesting because it became entangled with his increasingly obsessive promotion of what he would dub the Shaver mystery. It's interesting that Shaver himself had declared as early as October 1947 um, in, in, a, in a letter to Amazing Stories that the flying saucers were from outer space and were kidnapping earth women. So he's also like, predicting alien abduction in the 1940s, which is kind of like, quite interesting. Um, he, Shaver's material pre prefigures lots of UFO, UFO lore, as we shall see. Um, but it's also Palmer who's writing this stuff and relaying it onto an enthralled audience and really shaping um, the UFO law. In fact, Fortean writer John Keel claimed it was Palmer who really created the whole early flying saucer mythos and would shape ufology from then on. And it was the Shaver mystery itself that would be the, you know, at the core of what was scary about the flying saucer scare 
in, in the 1950s. So where did this material come from? In 1945, um, Shaver had responded to Palmer's request for more information with a long, rambling, 10,000-word account called A Warning to Future Man, which Palmer completely rewrote as a fictional 30,000-word tale, I Remember Lemuria, and published it in the March 1945 issue. Uh, and this is much before you know, the, the UFO scare began in 1947, you know, two years later. Um, Palmer's co-editor regarded the whole thing as totally crazy, but according to him, Palmer wanted to show that anything could sell with the right marketing and showmanship. In some respects, I remember Lemuria became a psychological freak show, but nonetheless, Palmer always professed his belief that there was a core truth to what Shaver was saying, and opinions vary about um, Palmer's integrity on that statement. In his first work, Shaver revealed that the prim primeval Earth, then known as Mu, had been colonised by several races of extraterrestrials, who in turn had bioengineered many other life forms, including the human race, and had created highly advanced culture on Mu, the largest Muan continent being called Lemuria, which later evolved in, um, into Atlantis, um, was supposedly based in North America. However, due to harmful radiation emitted from the sun, Mu became hostile to these life forms, and the civilization built underground shelters to protect itself. Alas, the underground world would prove also to be stunting and harmful, and these, many of these advanced races left Mu and headed off back into outer space. Those left behind, mostly a slave class composed of a mix of diverse extraterrestrials and artificial life forms, including the first humans, were referred to as Abandonero because they are the ones that had been left behind. And these recolonized the underground cities where they interbred, producing beings that became, um, eventually became the Dero. And these Dero were mostly uh, beings who would gradually mutate into monstrous hybrid creatures, um, who we refer to, as I said before, to these detrimental robots. Um, what he meant by robots in this sense was that they were completely controlled by their um, subconscious and sort of libido or energies and had no sort of self-control at all and sort of like automatic beings controlled by instinct um, and, 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 and particularly had no control over what he called their evil, evil urges. Um, and interestingly, these evil urges were mostly to do with depraved sex as well, which kind of shows this where his sort of like mind is coming from. Um, he... Shaver himself comes across, to a certain extent, as a fairly Puritan character um, who, th who sees these underground civilizations not only as being evil in a kind of a typical sense, but also depraved and in, in, in taking part in all sorts of degenerate orgies, as he called them, deep underground, using all these kind of various kinds of gadgets. Um, and, and, and these gadgets also um, increase their degeneration, um, in, including um, gadgets which, which Shaver called shocking sexual stimulization devices, which he said most of them spent their entire lives in. Um, so no wonder they were so sort of degenerate. Um, so he, he, he particularly has a sort of hang-up about this kind of like decadent sort of like life and orgies and sort of like depraved sexuality that sort of is going on there, down there. So which which kind of like points to a sort of a psychological uh, psychological sort of like, you know uh, source of this. Of this sort of th these beliefs, um, you know, psychiatric, perhaps with a better term, um, you know, for want of a better term. Um, so he's putting out these stories that most people can, you know, think are totally crazy. But but Palmer is printing them, rewriting them as as a kind of more coherent science fiction story, and and saying, well, this is what I, I, and I'm taking this at face value. Um, this is what what Shaver is saying. He says it's true. Um, how seriously at the time um, Palmer took all these stories um, is, is not certain. The interesting thing about these sort of demonic beings that, that, that uh, Shaver was writing about, um, they come in various forms and were causing all sorts of trouble to mankind um, through their inheritance of this advanced technology in these deep underground shelters. Um, they inherited 
these technology from aliens they called the Elder Gods, which is obviously a reference to H.P. Lovecraft here, who wrote about Elder Gods all the time. Um, but the Elder Gods had left, they'd left all this, this technology behind, deep underground, and the Dara, these mutants, uh, the hybridised mutants, were um, using this technology to influence sort of mankind on the surface. Um, they used this um, called, uh, with machines called ray machines, um, which he said put thoughts into the minds of humans and made them hear voices, obviously. Um, the Dero, because of this, were also referred to as the ray beings, um, because this was the medium that they manifest through and managed to communicate with most people. Uh, those familiar uh, with the psychoanalytic literature on the famous influencing machine by um, Victor Tausk um, will we'll see in this um, a, a great parallel with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with his descriptions of paranoid delusions or that the people have had throughout history, uh, or at least in, 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 in sort of history when, when machines and devices were, were um, you know, known of from the, sort of, um, the 18th century onwards, um, in which um, people believed that there were these mysterious devices um, which actually influenced what they were thinking and their behaviour. And most of these people that believed that had been diagnosed with various forms of, of what was called schizophrenia at the time. So if you read the psychoanalytic literature on the influencing machine and sort of like early theories about schizophrenia, and then you read uh, Shaver's reports about um, these influencing machines of the Dayro and these civilizations underground, there are huge parallels. Um, so it's, it's almost certain that this was a kind of a there was a delusional, a, a, a delusional content, to say the least, to um, two Shaver stories about these beings underground that were, that were manipulating him and other people. <coughs> Fortunately, Shaver was optimistic enough to add that not all the Abandonero had degenerated, as a small pocket groups of healthier, integrative humanoids had survived in the cave worlds, which he called the Tiro, the T for the positive energy, and it was these beings that fought against the Dero and sometimes helped us against them. Though even these had, had to some extent depraved sort of, uh, characteristics and had their own kind of like little orgies from time to time, which, you know, the horrified um, uh, Shaver. And more than that, the whole of humanity, he believed, were descended from a band of Nero who had, had not spent very long in the cavern worlds and had escaped to the surface early on, which explains why most humans were a little bit depraved to Shaver as well. Um, they're all connected to this like, alien being to some extent. Um, so it's, it's kind of clearly kind of like crazy stuff. And it's, you know, he's clearly suffering from what we would call schizophrenia. And I'm open-minded about, you know, there, there are lots of criticisms of, of, of psychiatric um, institutions and psychiatric theories. Um, but there obviously is, uh, you know, a schizophrenia of some form. And it does, um, it does manifest in this way. Um, other people think that schizophrenia may also have a certain psychic component, so we can't really dismiss everything that schizophrenics, schizophrenics say because they may be having some kind of uh, insights as well, or even some kind of insights into their own subconscious mechanisms. So what they're saying does have a certain amount of, of value, perhaps, but it is widely regarded that this kind of talk is is a kind of schizophrenic episode based. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's basically the modern understanding of what Shaver was saying. But in the writers, we can see that, that he's read previous literature, and there are fictional sources to a lot of the Shaver mystery writings, um, particularly from Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, Edgar Rice Burroughs, as well as a more contemporary horror authors at the time, um, such as H.P. Lovecraft, and one in particular, um, a pulp writer called um, Abraham Merritt, who was a friend of Lovecraft's, who had inspired a whole genre about lost civilizations of subterranean dwarfs, and, and, and was even mentioned by Shaver as a fellow witness to the Dero, um, who had obviously seen the horrific cavern worlds himself and decided to write about it as fiction. Um, but it also remains um, unclear how much of this early literature came from Shaver himself, or how much was added by Palmer when he rewrote a lot of, of uh, Shaver's works. There's also an, ob an obvious element of folklore in all this as well. Strange beings having inhabited caverns um, ha have been part of the mythic imagination since tales were told. 
perhaps accounting for part of the appeal of the Shaver mystery. Though Shaver would claim these were in fact ancient ancestral memories of the Dero, and in later accounts would claim that even the ancient gods of mythology um, were all extraterrestrials, um, as were later fairies, elves and goblins, um, the latter in particular being in various stages of degeneration of the abandoned Dero. Um, in fact, one alien character in the story is called Tim Shanta, uh, obviously a play on Tamo Shanta, which has sort of folklore associations. Um, tales of underground races like the Nagas of India and the legends of hidden worlds like Agati and Shambhala also found their way into the mix, which were being written about quite a lot in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and there's also an overlap with many of, of the bizarre phenomena described by Charles Fault, um, who was also the first author to suggest an alien astronaut thesis, um, which Shaver claimed was also the work of the Dero. So all these things like flying fishes out of the sky, which, uh, which uh, Charles Fort was writing about, was the work of the Dero, according to uh, Shaver. Um, so obviously this is like an Ur myth, a sort of a, a foundational myth, so with a great deal of appeal to Fortians, um, whether uh, they take it seriously or not. And it certainly um, multiplied the sales of the magazines with these kind of amazing kind of stories. It originally made amazing stories, whole with truly amazing stories. Um, and people were fascinated by the tales that, that Shaver was, was telling them about. Um, however, something even stranger was about to occur. Shaver's tales not only fascinated Palmer, um, they seemed to have an even greater fascination for many of his readers. Um, and so hundreds of, uh, dozens of readers um, started to write in supporting Shaver's claims, saying they too had been the victims of the ray machines, heard the voices, and some had even ex directly experienced the Dayro in the cavern worlds. Um, one of the most disturbing letters came from a woman who claimed to have gone into a deep basement of a building in Paris via a secret lift, um, only to find that it was linked to the cavern world. Here she encountered ape-like trolls who hunted reptiles in the caverns and humans on the surface, whom they hung on hooks until they were later eaten raw. Um, after months of rape and other tortures, as well as enforced drug taking, um, the woman was freed by the more benevolent Tiros and the allied star men, who she described as silver-suited, gaunt-faced grey beings, interestingly enough, um, who nonetheless subjected her to medical tests and memory erasure before she was released. Although how she actually told the story, if they gave her a memory erasure, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, so that's a kind of a contradiction in the story. But um, obviously it didn't work quite so well. Um, but this really you know, relates, the whole thing about these sort of grey beings and memory erasure and medical tests, again, it goes back to alien abduction. So this is kind of further indicating um, you know, nothing is new. All these sort of ufological stories you know, go back to these tales in the 1940s. Um, there was also a, a, a one, one tale that, 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 that Shaver um, actually published, which uh, indicated um, that there were a group of surface-dwelling humans who worked with the Dero and shared their sadistic tastes, perhaps anticipating the men in black. Um, a lot of these writers that, that weren't um, coming from um, Shaver's stories um, were anonymous, unfortunately. Um, and one anonymous writer confessed that sadly uh, no one believed her story and considered her to have severe mental problems. Um, but she insisted that it was all true. Uh, however, because these letters were anonymous, some people have suggested that it was Palmer himself was actually forging these letters to actually boost up um, the stories that uh, that that that, that, that Shaver was sending him, but the sheer number of letters does generally seem to have shocked Palmer, and it may have been this that, that eventually uh, began to lead him to supporting the Shaver theory himself, and start writing him his own material as if he really believed it. Whether, as as to that skeptics believe, this was just another cynical part on him. Um, just uh, writing stories that would boost up Shaver's stories and further boost up Amazing Stories sales, or whether he was really beginning to believe some of these stories is unknown. But he is quite convincing when he writes that he does seem to be you know, coming around to believing that, that Shaver's stories were almost true. 
Um, and he started to become obsessed, really, with what, what, he, what he termed the Shaver mystery. Um, Fortean historian Mike Dash has observed that such sadomastic elements in a lot of the stories were also uh, major elements um, in other sort of uh, schizophrenic um, sort of episodes. Um, perverted sex was a central part of Shaver's tales, another factor perhaps explaining their popularity. Um, and m the main targets of the Dayro often appear to be young nubile women who they captured in order to, to deprave and turn into sex slaves. Um, as Shaver put it, stim raves, stim raves were played over their naked bodies and, and a frightened prudish woman could easily be tr transformed into a depraved willing participant in a, de in a Dayro orgy in a matter of moments. Um, so he was obviously sort of getting off on it as well. Um, Palmer also claims he had to censor much of, the, of Shaver's writings due to its pornographic content. Um, but he knew he was on tour in it and commissioned and edited more and more of Shaver's work, um, reaching a peak in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in, in the June 1947 issue of Amazing Stories, which was entirely devoted to the Shaver mystery and related, similar related tales. And the Shaver mystery from then on would, be, would dominate Palmer's magazines for over a decade. Now, what happens at this stage is there's an interesting development from, from serious science fiction writers who are absolutely disgusted by what um, Amazing Stories was publishing, um, which they saw as cheap exploitation of schizophrenia and, or just outright hoaxes and bemoaned the decline of serious science fiction in Amazing Stories. Such, a, uh, such as the vociferous faction, um, led by Forrest Ackerman, um, who had all previously written for the magazine, and included a young Harlan Ellison, um, who actually possibly was the first person to, to use the term the Shaver hoax. Um, and he claimed that Palmer had made most of it up himself, um, and, and very little of it actually came from Shaver. Although since then, um, Shaver's original writings turned up, and it does seem a lot of it did come from Shaver. But at the time, they were accusing Palmer of basically making all that stuff himself just to sell the magazine. Um, despite this, it didn't stop Ellison later on writing a short story based loosely on, on the Darrow myth called The Elevator People. Um, and uh, Philip K. Dick, who was a little bit more sympathetic to Shaver's mythos, um, used some of his descriptions um, in. in uh, to, to, to describe a UFO cult, cult he, just, he wrote about in his straight novel, The Confessions of a Crap Artist, in the 1970s. And, and the Darrow mythos was also taken up um, by the spoof religion, the Church of the Subgenius, who um, used it quite a lot. But the more sceptical writers launched a campaign to get Palmer fired and return uh, Amazing Story to its former serious style. This initially failed as subscriptions had tripled under Palmer, but by the late 1947, by late 1947, his publishers were becoming increasingly concerned about his obsession and restricted his involvement with the magazine. In response, Palmer would claim that the truth was being suppressed and created two new publications of his own, Other Worlds, a science fiction magazine, um, of which he had total control, and Fate magazine, a factual magazine specialising in the bizarre and the paranormal, um, in some ways it's like an early version of 14 Times, um, both of which which would uh, heavily feature um, the Shaver mystery and its various aspects. By um, 1949, however, the hype um, was beginning to wear off and subscriptions of amazing stories began to fall, at which point either Palmer resigned, um, he was fired, or he was forced out, according to the various diverse uh, accounts of events, and the magazine returned to its pre-shaver format, pr um, was pr promoted by the co-editor who had been um, uh, promoted to editor. Uh, Palmer then devoted himself to his own projects, first Fate magazine, which he edited until 1955, and then Other Worlds, um, which he, he, he promoted it up until uh, the late or that 1950s. Um, he also produced a short-run publication, Hidden Worlds, which published Shaver's raw, un unedited writings um, in response to people that were saying that Palmer was making it all up himself. 
in the course of this, Palmer had become increasingly interested in the UFO phenomena since the Kenneth Arnold encounter and, and had hired Arnold to write on the phenomena for the first issue of Fate magazine back in 1948. Oddly, he had also received letters um, from the mysterious Fred Kreisman, who claimed to have battled the Darrow in the underground caverns. Um, Kreisman himself is another interesting character, um, well known as a Walter Mitty type character, full of tall tales, but, but also many believed him to be a contract operative for the CIA, um, including the infamous, infamous DA Jim Garrison, who would later briefly implicate Kreisman in the JFK assassination. Um, while others claimed he was close to uh, George Wackenhut, a security expert, and a gay s and fanatic. So it gets a bit deeper and, and complex as we go on. Um, but back in 1947, Fred Kreisman had also become the central figure of the Maori Island UFO incident, the second big UFO story of that year, in which a so-called flying saucer had allegedly dropped some slag-like discharge on Kreisman's boat, Two U.S. Air Force intelligence officers died in an air crash after retrieving samples of this material, and the first men in black were reported. Um, Kreisman later confessed that the whole thing was a hoax gone wrong, but later would claim that this confession in itself had been forced out of him by mysterious agents. The case remains one of the biggest mysteries of the period. But whatever the truth, this proved a link between the Shaver mystery and the UFOs that many readers and well, many readers were, were, were becoming interested in. And from then on, Ray Palmer was hooked on the UFO phenomena and increasingly added it to his mythic repertoire. Shaver had initially described the beings in his stories using rockets, but both Palmer and Shaver himself would increasingly link their, their craft to the mysterious flying saucers being reported across America at the time, an identification he justified through references back to, to uh, Merritt's fiction, which included shell-shaped hovercraft used by high-tech subterranean short, short dwarves. Palmer's magazine sh soon changed its name to Flying Saucers from Other Worlds, and in 1957 just became Flying Saucers. By the 1960s, flying saucers, however, had become a little less, uh, less centred on the Shaver mystery and became a typically ET-centred UFO magazine, as was the market of the time. Um, however, themes from the Shaver mystery would continue to inform popular conceptions of UFOs and their occupants for decades to come, and still do. Shaver's most amazing claim, claim came early in the, in the mystery when Palmer asked him how he knew so much about all this. Initially, uh, Shaver declared that the information came from the Tero thought transference machines via what he called a Telaug tel ray machine, a process which, he be which began when, when he was a welder after his welding tool began to pick up voices from the cavern world and transform, transfer them into his mind. He, he soon added that this contact had led him to actually living in the cavern world with the Tiro for anything between a few weeks and eight years. Shaver, Shaver's claims were often inconsistent, but had a kind of genuinely, a genuine kind of central theme that he had been in the cavern world for uh, you know, a long period of time. Palmer at first took all this at face value, publishing it uncritically in his magazines, but by the, by the early 1970s, he claimed he had later discovered that Shaver had actually been in a mental hospital for those eight years and was described by his doctors as being in a constant catatonic state. Unperturbed, um, Palmer published this but declared it confirmed his own belief that Shaver's experiences were psychical and occurred within his mind when he was, his body was actually in the hospital. From this, Palmer would soon develop a completely paranormal account of the Shaver mystery, a claim denied by Shaver himself, who insisted his experience were physically real and his hospitalisation was a lie concocted by the Darrow. The events of these years in Shaver's life are highly controversial. Shaver denied hospitalisation, admitting to only a very few short stays in hospitals for sunstroke, 
and a, a few longer stays in prison. While Palmer's own claims of access to his private <coughs> medical records are, are themselves dubious, most cases of catatonia are known to only last for a few days and only rarely for a few weeks, but never for a number of years. Palmer's sources seem to have come from a nurse at the hospital and the account may be inaccurate or, or elaborated. Existing records seem to indicate a more fragmented life of frequent hospitalisation and imprisonment up, and, uh, up until he left in the mid-1940s, punctuated by a nomadic lifestyle as a down and out. Despite this, many readers supported Palmer's paranormal theory and an equal number still maintained the caves were real and inhabited by a strange race. Sadly though, part of the case appeared to be somewhat tragic. Shaver had begun an earlier career as an artist and writer, but in 1934 his brother Taylor died suddenly of a heart attack. The two were very close and he took to heavy drinking which eventually led him to being admitted to a Detroit receiving hospital a year later. There, he had, his, had insisted that a demon called Max had killed his brother and was now after him as well. He was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and had to be restrained. On his release from the asylum in 1936, he returned to a normal life, only to learn that his wife had been electrocuted in an accident when a heater fell into her bath. He then became convinced demons were persecuting him. He, he became a homeless traveller and confessed that he had trouble separating reality from his dreams and visions, including nightmares of gigantic spiders. During this time, he attempted to stow away on a ship to England and was imprisoned various times, Eventually, suffering a complete mental breakdown, he became a longer-term mental patient and was apparently catatonic for a short while before being released in the mid-1940s. It was then he started writing to Palmer and claimed he had been contacted by the Tero in one of these periods of in incarceration. The details of how this happened would change over the years. One tale involved a beautiful blonde Tero woman who would materialise in his cell and take him to the cavern world. Over the years covering the late 40s and early 50s, Shaver would supply Palmer with numerous historical accounts of the Dero and other aliens, which Palmer or his team of writers would fictionalise as short novels. What is particularly interesting about these, these is, is the number of UFO tropes that they predate. Long before Adamski, Shaver would be writing about the Nortons, a name rather like the Nordics, who he described as tall, pale blondes of a fey-like nature, who dwell in the darkness of deep space on artificial planets, very much like a Damstead's description of his Venusians a few years later. And, and these later became the stereotypical Nordics of cliched UFO encounters. By the mid-1950s, post Adamski, Shaver was explicitly associating these Nortons with flying saucers. Um, prior to this, they only flew rockets, um, demonstrating that the influence of, 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 of ideas was working in both directions and as the, as the Shaver mystery was evolving. Some of the Tiro were also described in similar terms to these Nordics, but most were said to be tall, dark-skinned, Latin-like men, which was another uh, classic UFO entity type, particularly in the 1950s. Um, if this wasn't enough, he also described the Freyans, um, small bald dwarves who kidnapped people, um, the Outlanders, tall reptilian aliens, and various goblins from other planets, one of whom lived in a secret underground city in Arabia. Um, obviously a very Lovecraft influence there. Um, but, a, but all of these descriptions predate similar beings associated with UFO reports. Uh, curiously, he also wrote, wrote about a secret group called the Secret Ray of America, which were agents of the Dero who disguised themselves as FBI agents about the same time, or just prior to, the emergence of the Men in Black Law, whose own mythos was hugely influenced by the writings of Gray Barker, as we've earlier seen, was one of Obama's main writers. Later in the 60s, John Keel, an associate of Barker's, would claim one group of Men in Black identified themselves as the Nation of the Third Eye, 
a term he associated with the legend of Agati, an ancient subterranean city of Indian folklore. The entwining of imagery here is quite strange. Another curious trope Shaver used um, is was also reminiscent of UFO encounters. Was the, was, it is a use of names from human mythology used by professed aliens. Though he seems to have been familiar with the writings of Charles Fort, who long ago suggested that the entities of human mythology may have been extraterrestrials. Later, when the Shaver mystery began to lose its appeal, outside of a few cult magazines, uh, some produced by Shaver himself, he focused his attention on a brand new discovery, um, the rock books, which, were which he believed were images from the past projected into rocks by advanced technology. Shaver would basically break open a stone from, from a cavern or old mine um, and treat the, the inner surface in a way that he could project light through it onto a screen. The patterns so produced revealed to Shaver both beautiful and horrific scenes from, from the past, which he used as templates for highly surrealistic paintings. A modern observer might regard these images as a kind of psychological gestalt that, was, that Shaver was developing on in his paintings, um, as they featured many of Shaver's obsessions, sadism, monsters, heroes, and often both seductive and helpless women. But Shaver insisted that they were secret history books giving the history of the underground world. These fascinating works, interestingly, attracted genuine art interest as some new manifestation of surrealism, and Shaver managed to live on the proceeds of these art exhibitions um, and his continual reminiscences until he died in the mid-1970s. Oddly, when Shaver died, and Palmer died just a few years later, so their lives seem to have been fairly entwined. Now, that, that's the end of the productive period of the Shaver mystery. Um, and it would seem to be fairly easy to dismiss most of this as simply the delusions of Shaver developed into pulp sci-fi by Ray Palmer and his various magazines, something that later became entangled with the evolving mythos of the UFO phenomenon. Yet there are other aspects of the mystery that are harder to explain away. One of these is, that, is when Palmer um, claimed that he made a short visit um, um, after the successful publication of I Remember Lemuria to Shaver and his wife in Pennsylvania and had what he had called a novel experience and an eerie one. On his first evening with the Shaver family, Palmer claimed to have heard Shaver's Tiro himself coming from a locked room, a curious um, chorus of five um, strange voices sometimes speaking all at once, describing awful tortures in a cave four miles below. Palmer claimed to have searched the room for recording devices and microphones, but found nothing. Others have said on visiting Shaver's home that these voices came out of Shaver's own mouth when he was in some kind of trance. Palmer returned to Chicago a complete believer, he says, um, in Shaver's claims, but increasingly saw them as a paranormal phenomena rather than a physical one. Curiously, later in, Shaver, uh, in life, Shaver made a strange admission to the effect that those who say the cavern world was not really beneath our feet, but in the sky, as he put it, in some other astral dimension, might in fact be right. But either way, the phenomenon was a real one. All this could be dismissed as more fabrication from Palmer, of course, who always sought to make Shaver's wild stories more believable to his audience. Yet there are independent tales that appear to lend support to Shaver's claims. We have already heard the tale of an, of an anonymous reader of, of Amazing Stories, which might have been another hoax, but there is one more tale that is harder to dismiss. A subgenre of Shaver's tales told in Amazing Stories included accounts from readers of haunted caves and mine shafts. Within this genre, one notorious tale would emerge involving strange hooded figures emerging from a remote mine tunnel who were said to be armed with ray wands which could paralyse a witness or even electrocute them with a single zap. This account came from a very curious character called Steve Broody. Broody was a mysterious artist 
who was, in, who was encountered by the respected ufologist um, John Robinson in 1945. Like Shaver, he was an imaginative painter um, who produced strange otherworldly scenes. But when Robinson showed him a copy of Amazing Stories, in which the tales of the cavern world were, were, were portrayed, Brody allegedly was shocked and exclaimed, he writes about the Darrow? He went on to describe his explorations of a disused mine shaft and encounter with these cowed figures in black who captured him and imprisoned him in the, ca in the caverns. His fellow prisoners, who were all missing people, told him his captors were slavers called the Dero, an ancient mutant race who could capture people even in the heart of the city. The Dero would use these ones to pacify people as well as placing electrodes behind their ears to control them. But one day, uh, Brody said he found himself wandering in Times Square as if he had woken up from a dream, apparently released by his captors. Robinson was sceptical at first, but was shocked when Bro Brody brushed back his hair to, to reveal electrode marks still burned behind his ears. It was this story that was later retold in Amazing Stories. Brody, unfortunately, later moved on out of his flat and became untraceable though there were reports of him um, still as a drifter travelling around America retelling his stories. This is an incredible story and it's hard to know what to make of it. Robinson was well known as a no-nonsense serious investigator, yet he constantly claimed his story was true. And because of this, he has become regarded as an independent conf confirmation of Shaver's tales by many, and it is admittedly very odd. However, things still remain ambiguous. Robinson was a friend of Gray Barker, Palmer's most notorious writer, an, as an association perhaps not uncommon then in a tiny field of ufology, but he could have, been, have joined him in a hoax, as Barker was well known to have done several times. Um, though if that was so, it was very much in contrast to his reputation as a serious investigator. Another oddity that other people have, have raised is that the alleged burn marks behind Brodie's ears um, appear to have suggested um, that, that they, he may have had electroshock therapy. Uh, some th people complain that these marks behind the ears are very similar to um, marks left by electroconvulsive therapy used in mental hospitals. Um, I haven't been able to confirm or deny that claim. Yet this seems to confirm that at least one aspect of reality exists behind Robinson's claims that he did actually speak to someone who had burned marks behind his ears. But obviously it also opens up the speculation that the real nature of, of Brody's incarcer incarceration and exactly who he met there. The term Dero appears to be a term coined solely by Shaver himself. So could Brody have actually met Shaver in, an, in, in a hospital or met someone else who had actually contacted Shaver and been told his stories then? We don't know, it's very hard to confirm. Alternatively, could there be some underlying truth to the mystery? The notion of a secret subterranean race seems ridiculous, and almost certainly is, yet Palmer's reinterpretation of it as a paranormal phenomena involving some other reality is more plausible, even if barely so. One thing that seems clear is that Shaver's mystery is deeply archetypal, in the loosest sense of the word, and relates to mythic tales of the underworld found in myths of all cultures. It can also easily be seen as a symbolic metaphor as well, with, with the subterranean world representing the unconscious, the home of all sorts of energies and complexes. These mythic and psychological perspectives are not incompatible, of course. Even if Shaver was unbalanced and delusional, this would not detract from these possibilities, and if anything, could make them more likely if the barrier between his conscious and unconscious mind had been broken through some kind of mental trauma. Perhaps this was, was the case, or perhaps Shaver was simply suffering from schizophrenia, however that label is applied. We cannot know for sure. One thing I can confirm personally is the ease with which similar images come to the mind of meditators who explore such mythological, mythological imagery in light hypnotic trance, as I have done on many occasions. A psychological phenomena akin to the symbolism of dreams 
that can even extend to UFO imagery where underground <coughs> colonies interact with star bases if you use that kind of sci-fi mythology. The world remains a mysterious and complex place whose true nature we may never completely fathom. But phenomena like the Shaver mystery may open up a window to its more stranger aspects. So, an interesting story. Yeah, the hell is. I think that I found it good to learn that sort of.